Hey everybody, I'm uh, Andy Freeborn, um, hacking all the things, and today we're going to talk about uh, breaking JavaScript and uh, APIs and web apps. It's the new hotness, so you know, why not? A little about me. Um, now I was, you know, just kind of job over uh, being a pen tester at uh, UPacific, and so a lot of pen clicking and a lot of dank memes. That's kind of what I'm best for, but also uh, testing security and web apps and mobile apps and all kinds of security. Uh, in both web app mobile testing and as well as uh, fit clients and uh, SCADA environments. And I love uh, different kinds of CPU architectures and again the Dake memes. You know, current favorite is uh, Evil Kermit, so that kind of keeps me going. And who doesn't love that? So today, you know, kind of a little bit of agenda. Uh, you know, kind of talk about the why of this talk and kind of what things we're going to talk about and why you know the motivations for this kind of uh, talk. And then uh, tools to identify and uh, break the, all the things. Not all the things, but many things. And I have a thing to break if we have tools to break stuff. And then we're going to do a demo. So hopefully that works out. But you know, we'll see how that goes. So the why. As you can see here on this picture, there's a lot of colors here for JavaScript. And basically, in a JavaScript in a uh, corporate or even small business environment, you have a bajillion kinds of jQuery, Angular, Mustache, Backbone. You know, like all those things, you know, work very well for a specific uh, use case that business may use it for. But how often are we evaluating that specific version of jQuery and saying, oh, we're on 1.6. We should really be on the next version for a variety of reasons. The developer says, well, that costs money and time. And I say, well, because security, we should. So. As we can see from the ZDNet article, there's a ton of different varieties of JavaScript frameworks in use today. And it's only going to get worse as you know, developers find this cool new thing to play with and develop it and then you know, use it in production and trying to keep on top of that. So as security people, we need to make sure that we're aware of this new versioning format of incorporating different versions of uh, JavaScript in the environment in production and how we're aware of these kind of frameworks and making sure that we know that you know we can do our best to really be you know aware and kind of keep that the ball rolling of being updated and secure. But really, really, we know the reason with uh, JavaScript is a problem because it's evil. So the bane of all of our, oh bane of our existence. So you know really with when we talk to developers on assessments, we say we found this version of jQuery or Mustache, and they say why are we update it. Let me say because security. But really, it's a problem that not only that we face in our organization, but any kind of place where you find a highly deployed uh, product, you're going to have a lot of people looking, putting eyeballs on that and bad actors trying to exploit that. And just ask anybody that runs WordPress. I mean, how, to, how often are they trying to update and keep on top of their platform to make sure that they're secure? And so commonly, you're going to see you know, we'll always see a lot of low risk vulnerabilities. We see, oh, this version of, of jQuery, it's not really a high, uh, you know, high risk to the organization, but it's kind of a low risk. Oh, now we see uh, a no, uh, low risk and say a, uh, the WAF. Kind of against information, but again, that's kind of low risk. And oh yeah, we see all these different kind of vulnerabilities. Well, when we're seeing all these kind of different vulnerabilities, somebody can be really clever and chain all those things and use all those vulnerabilities to help make an exploitation. So like in Airbnb here in this article, we see that all of these were low vulnerabilities, but chained together, they compromise Airbnb. So yeah, the business may say, well, it's a low risk. We'll take that risk and not really worry too much about it, though. But if there's not enough low risk vulnerabilities, you could become in a high risk situation and be compromised. So we should be aware that, yeah, we can accept this risk, but we need to make sure that we're aware that the more things we accept, the more risk we're at. And so not only are we seeing JavaScript used a lot, we're also seeing APIs used a lot. So that's great for a developer. That's great to have APIs, to have a lot of cross-compatibility between platforms to share the data. I mean, that's really what businesses want to do is consume and use and uh, have that data readily available to other people to use and consume and be you know, invested in their platform. So a common platform for APIs, you know, is currently served out through REST. And so 
If I am, say, a vulnerability management company, or say I'm a, vent, uh, a company that uses vulnerability management data, I can get data from one vendor's tool, and then get data from another person's tool, and then combine that using their APIs. But APIs, again, are software and have their own challenges. Unfortunately, with APIs, it's kind of seen as like a uh, taboo thing to question as far as how do we make sure this API is secure and who's testing it and making sure it is secure. I mean, we say, oh, the API is up. I hope it works okay. I hope it's secure, but it's not really a mature part of a secure, uh, security testing uh, methodology to make sure that we're just hammering that API and making sure we're kind of shaking it down as much as possible, all the little hanging fruit, and the dip in depth as much as possible to make sure we're getting, you know, our MISO making sure it's secure either through a uh, third party or internally developed API. And interestingly enough, uh, the OWASP team, they're working on a new 20, uh, top 10 for 2017. As you can see, for A10, is under protected APIs. So now, for the first time, we're seeing APIs specifically called out as a problem that you know we need to make sure is a top 10 problem that we're just you know we're seeing in the environment, but we're not really testing very thoroughly. So again, making sure APIs are you know um, a thing that we're going to test and break and you know, manipulate and see if it you know behaves as it should and with the results that we want. So the best way to do all the hacking is with Chrome. And really, you know, Chrome and Firefox developer tools are crazy awesome. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and retired JS, it's a great platform as well. And then Note Security and uh, Sync. Again, two great tools with Cover and Postman, uh, an API uh, developer tool mostly. And the vulnerable, uh, venerable uh, Burp Suite. You know, Burp is still, you know, relevant today as it was 10 years ago or five years ago. And so using Burp, you know, in this use case is still very valid and, uh, you know, a, a valuable part of anybody's tool, uh, tool set. So again, with Chrome and Firefox, you know, we, come, as we just saw in Brad's talk, that Chrome has a large share of the uh, market. And so developers highly target, uh, you know, compatibility with Chrome and Firefox and Sometimes Internet Explorer, sometimes. But, and with both Firefox and with uh, Chrome, they bundle in the baseline version of developer tools. And so these developer tools are great to have, you know, a lot of debugging capabilities, uh, introspection, uh, ways to manipulate and resend, and just basically wreak havoc with uh, any website. You know, as a common user, they just say, oh, check out my email, but as a tester, these are valuable tools that if I'm on engagement or I'm at a client site, you know, this is a great tool because it's not com commonly saw as like a threat or a way to compromise a website. But, you know, it's just kind of like that hurdle of knowledge and uh, acceptance of, you know, using developer tools against them to make sure, you know, we're also doing our job. And there's a lot of uh, places available from Google. I'm sure Firefox is a tool to walk through the, the tools and how they work and understand how to do debugging, and inspection, and uh, you know, really get to know it to be you know, a valuable tool set. And then why use it? It's easy to test for a variety of issues. I mean, quickly, if I uh, use the depth tools, I can see headers, I can see all kinds of methods, I can do a lot of th different things and validate security and see if like the, base, the bare basics are being done, like are we enabling secret cookies? Are we using SSL only? So a lot, a lot of the low hanging fruit can quickly be identified without busting out Burp or you know, using kind of tools that we can use to help uh, you know, assess like kind of low hanging fruit. So just even with these tools themselves, we can accomplish a great deal of testing. So with testing, for example, we have, if we use these tools, we can quickly see the source code for all these uh, JavaScript files, um, CSS, and kind of things like that. So developers are a lot of fun. They'll leave comments, they'll do a lot of things that necessarily you know, don't really impact the user's experience, but a lot of artifacts look behind as far as like Jira ticket numbers or people's names or when it was changed or what vulnerability was addressed or comment out source code that doesn't, you know, you know oh, let's take it out later, but it was left over for whatever reason. So you can see in the top part here, 
we can see all the, uh, in the, the routes that this Angular app is going to use for a model view controller type of application, all the routes. So we can see right there in the first one, administration. So we're going to say, oh, off the bat, we can see there's an administrative uh, portal that you know, could be, you know, is it off? Is it having kind of vulnerabilities associated with that? And in the bottom, we see a, a commentary link to a scoreboard. That's interesting. But again, these are problems that if it doesn't need to be in the code for the source or the source code, let's take it out. It does no harm to us at all. It just only gives the attacker more information to our internal working processes, uh, names for our social engineering, any kind of myriad tactics that we see as a low threat, but chained together can be, you know, exploit exploitative. So when we do look at the source, most of the time it's on the left where there's like three ginormously long lines of text and it's a painful look. But, uh, let's see if we can, if we see this little helpful message pretty print, we click on the screen braces, we get on the right a much better and easier to read version of the source code that you know, is formatted very nicely for us and helps us quickly you know, uh, review the source code for whatever we want to try to look for. And uh, you know, from our point of view, if we're doing a source code analysis or whatever we're going to be doing, we can have a much better view of the source code. So I highly recommend, if you're going to look at the source, do the pretty print always. So for uh, attacker focus tools and uh, information gathering, a uh, tool I like to call, uh, use is uh, retire.js. So uh, retire.js has been around for a while. Uh, it, it detects uh, vulnerable uh, JavaScript uh, libraries as well as uh, uh, node packages. It's uh, free. It's available there at the GitHub, and it's uh, regularly <coughs> updated as uh, JavaScript and uh, packages age. So you know, like, oh, there's a new mustache. And so we see the, the, the maintainers that go through there and say, oh, version 1.5 is now vulnerable to this thing. You know, upgrade to whatever the package you know, says to use. And a lot of times, with this tool and others, there'll be a specific uh, disclosures of uh, articles and the specific reason why that library is vulnerable, like say SQL injection or a denial of service or regex exploit. It's all using this, this is very easy to use. It's a pretty versatile. So that Yeah, you can uh, use it in a variety of situations. You can uh, use it to scan your package.json file, or you can use it to uh, scan, you know, you can also have it as an extension in Chrome and Firefox. So as you're browsing a website, if you have this extension installed, it'll automatically it's be scraping like through the console, and it will output it through the console, the uh, say, oh, this version of jQuery has this vulnerability. Okay, so I guess it's determined this version is vulnerable because we're using this particular version. Yeah. So it's just looking for types of JavaScript libraries mm -hmm. versions on that and it should hold back the JavaScript version. Yeah. And it's continuing updated. So you know, ways, you know, to the easy grabs are through the extensions. So just like surfing through the website, you can quickly see, oh yeah, this jQuery. <clears throat> but another version, the way to also check is uh, standalone on through the command line. That's gonna check the JSON file where you can have all your packages and all your library versions, say a SQLize or Sanitize. And uh, it's very helpful and powerful and you know, pretty easy to use. And another one is through uh, uh, Zap and Burp. They both have extensions for retire when they uh, you know, do active and passive scanning. They'll also do more checks for that as well. But for, uh, but for BERT, it requires a Pro license. But for Zap, it's a free extension and it's pretty powerful. <coughs> and here we can see an example of what uh, retire.js will show as a browser extension. You'll see we have you know, all the Angular files there in jQuery. Our, you know, that version 1.5.11 of Angular is vulnerable. At that point of time, you know, that's very helpful for me as a tester when I'm doing a report, saying, oh yeah, found this version of Angular at that place, why it's vulnerable, kind of like what they assess the, the risk to be, and uh, be very helpful for screenshots and reports and quickly identifying to the developer, like, let's get a new version and help uh, remediate these issues. <coughs> 
But the more in-depth uh, way of using the tire is through the, the command line. Uh, so we can see here, using the command line, scanning a package.json file, we can see that you know, through this wall of text, SQLize 1.7.11 has potential SQL injection problems. So again, we can see like the node security.io advisory linking to that uh, version of SQLize and uh, the problem associated with that <coughs> library. And also calling out uh, two more tools that operate basically in the same way, uh, you know, basically. <coughs> Excuse me. The first one is a node security platform, project from uh, Lyft, and uh, actually, I don't see it here, uh, Nick uh, Stark, I think his last name is. <coughs> he helps maintain this project, he's here based in Iowa, and um, you know, maintains all these kind of advisories. And so a lot of the tools like our Retire and uh, Sync and NSP, of course, will reference node security pro uh, advisories and kind of like keep the, you know, additional crowdsourced version, you know, uh, crowdsourced repository information. And again, that's a, it scans a directories and the JSON files and the, the, uh, <coughs> the node packages as well. And Sync is pretty cool too. Sync, you can uh, basically go to the website and say, I want to scan this public uh, GitHub repo. So it'll scan anything from JavaScript, Ruby, Java, and um, it kind of, it, a, a, you know, a lot of things. And so you can see in the bottom there with this uh, sync scan from uh, this anonymous GitHub re repository, we see that the commit that was scanned, the known vulnerabilities associated with this formal pass, potentially causing problems with this uh, project, and the dependencies, all the different, different kind of libraries associated with this. So quickly, I can see it for free, you know, if we have uh, public or private, private, you get as well for the free tier, a uh, quick assessment of uh, vulnerabilities associated with your project. Uh, the next tool uh, is Postman. Now, so Postman is a great tool for a developer uh, and QA people as well. So Postman is primarily used with APIs and assessing that and uh, kind of being a, a team tool used to share testing and scenarios and do validation testing. But for security people like me, that's also a great tool because we make sure developers are you know, doing what they should be doing. So from here, from Postman, I can quickly pro poke, try to break uh, APIs. I can save that query and send it to a teammate and say, this is what I did, you know, if I'm out sick or whatever the case may be, and also a second set of validation. I can quickly share that information with another team member and then like, oh yeah, I gotta set curl, you gotta do this kind of thing, or oh yeah, you have version of 2.7 of Python, get out of town. So uh, you know, everybody should be using Python 3, that's a different debate. So, uh, you know, another free tool, and uh, you know, Slope UI is a great tool as well. You know, it's kind of been around for a while, but uh, Postman is kind of the fresh new thing, and why not? So, you know, but that also works great too. You know, it's a great tool uh, in the toolbox. Curl, you know, is great for quick and dirty testing as well for an API and setting off a, um, you know, a variety of different uh, queries. And then Python, it, however you want to do it, it's great, but, you know, just letting everybody know that, you know, a different way of doing it is fine too. And so, you know, great thing with, you know, Postman is free. I have a history, so I can quickly say, oh yeah, back on the 24th, I did this test, I can just this query, oh, boom, I can just, Quickly, just like click play, you know, uh, click click scan, or the top right button. We'll see later, and quickly redo the test with the same parameters. You know, probably need a new token, but I can quickly reiterate quickly through different kind of testing scenarios, saving me time. So another problem we see with um, having uh, client side security controls, other on client side. Well, if I don't use a client side client, I don't have that restriction. So this is another way as well to validate that the back end is doing validation testing as well. So, I mean, if, if you're relying only on the client, if you're not using a client, it's gonna be pretty hard to have that control there to protect the application itself. So, I mean, Postman, the things you can do with Postman can also be done in Zapper and a lot of different ways. But just keeping that in mind as uh, writing, up a, uh, writing up the report, say, well, if you're relying solely on client type controls, they can be commented out or bypassed entirely, so definitely having that defense in depth layer of uh, protection 
helps validate both sides of that transaction. <coughs> so, you know, MidTech talks we'll talk about BERT. Still a great tool. It's a great tool for proxying requests and uh, doing assessments. And, uh, you know, it's still pretty cheap at $3.99 per user. But even the free version is very well. It doesn't have a lot of the features in Pro. And a lot of the extensions in Burp require Pro, but completely worth it as a tester or even an internal organization. Definitely should be a standard tool used. But if not, Zap is another tool as well. But you know, if by all means, please get Burp and, and try all the things. But both tools <coughs> are continually updated with new uh, features and functionalities as the websites themselves change with more WebSocket-based communications and kind of different APIs and kind of keeping up with the times with um, the ever-changing landscape. So we see again in the screenshot, <coughs> we see this uh, website transaction. We see that there's a put operation, a uh, put option uh, available that in this transaction. If you can see on the bottom there, and it's kind of hard to see, we see a quantity and a two. So uh, as, again, if we're testing security, we should be really limit, limiting what kind of operation op options we limit to uh, each transaction. Do we allow put, delete, and update on everything or only on certain operations? And so do we only allow get and post or just even get? So we gotta be mindful of how the developers allowing people to communicate with the application and if they're just like, oh, it'll be fine, I'll, put, I'll allow put. But put's a very dangerous operation as it be put information back onto the system. Or delete, you know, the same way, take off the server. So as we make sure that as we're assessing, we're being mindful of what are the options available to us. If I were to do a put operation instead of a get, would that work? And why not? You know, why wouldn't it work? So kind of the why not attitude of like, I'll just try it. If it's a 404 or denied, <clears throat> he said tried. So finally, the thing to break is the OWASP juice shop. So the juice shop is a intentionally uh, insecure web app for security training. It's kind of assessing, uh, kind of helping people, you know, get into the uh, you know, habit of how I look at a JavaScript-based application with APIs and how I break that. Kind of the motivation for this was at my last location, last uh, position, um, I was asked to um, pen test this, um, this new product and this uh, user form. This user form was entirely done in JavaScript and had APIs. And so, um, you know, I did the, the testing, but I thought, like, as far as a community, how if I had never seen JavaScript only applications that had APIs, how would I learn this? How would I try to? understand the problems associated with this in a safe environment and how can I make this, you know, you know, better my skills to, you know, learn this kind of particular, you know, growing field of uh, web apps. And so I finally found the OWASP Juice Shop that does just that. And, um, you know, it's a great, ver uh, great application. It's constantly updated by uh, Bjorn Kimmick and uh, Kimmick. And it even has a CTF uh, version as well. So, you know, pretty cool thing as well. But we'll see kind of how there's like a mini CTF in it already. But, you know, this is a different strategy as well for having like within a shop, a, C a CTF, or with a uh, local meetups, so we have a CTF based on Juice Shop as well. And it's continually updated. Like just two days ago, um, he just updated new languages, uh, more CTF uh, focused uh, updates, uh, new vulnerabilities, and 2.26. And uh, the author recommends uh, not cheating. But it's kind of an interesting point, you know, not cheating. Well, bad guys don't care about that. I mean, bad guys are like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't cheat. I shouldn't go to the GitHub. Well, they will. I mean, they're not going to stop. At, you know, bad guys aren't going to think like, oh, I really should only go through the main application. I shouldn't try to use Postman or I shouldn't try to like use the API in a, a bad way. So, I mean, for me, by all means, do anything you can to break it. You know, try to learn, break it as fast and as soon as possible. I mean, bad guys are going to try to get low hanging fruit. Why can't you? Why can't you also try those kind of things that you know show up on a you know on a scan or just kind of a little bit of, of uh, testing? So it's not really cheating if you're trying to learn, I guess. 
And so with uh, this application, it runs in a variety of places. You know, it's, it's great how the developer tried to make it as much as possible accessible everywhere. It could be run on Heroku for free, on a dyno, and um, in fact, the bottom right there online right now, that's running on a dyno, free dyno. And anybody can right now go to that website and start breaking uh, the juice shop. That's uh, owned by the developer, but I mean, that's free. Don't need any kind of VM or anything like that. But today, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be running this on a Docker container. Or I can run in the cloud on AWS or on your own VM. Excuse me. So for my machine, for my demo, I'm just running on a basic Ubuntu 16.04 LTS uh, server. So nothing fancy, nothing accessible. Very uh, easy to spin up, uh, download, and kind of get familiar with using Unity still. Long live Unity, but that's a whole different discussion. So download the ISO, boot it up, and do a pseudo applicant update and uh, upgrade. And then installing Docker, the latest uh, Docker CE versions. Uh, that you have a great uh, set of instructions, are very straightforward. You know, let, I would say less than two minutes of work, not even probably two minutes, you know, not counting the download time and the update, update time. I had a system ready to download, to run uh, the juice shop. So basically, <clears throat> once you install Docker, pull down the Docker image of juice shop, Docker run, and then uh, with those primers for backgrounding and running on port 3000, with that image name, with that image of Juice Shop, and you have it running. You have it, you know, with no effort of doing anything else, like make sure Apache is cool or anything like that and trying to robot permissions. You have something ready to rock and roll. <clears throat> so, sometimes you'll see a lot of things like Metasploitable 3 or different kind of versions of uh, intentionally insecure web apps. They kind of say, go ahead and find the vulnerabilities. That's kind of part of the learning process, right? Well, if you're new, it's kind of intimidating. You know, we're all new once, and so, you know, I'm always going to say, "Oh, yeah, this is what you should do first. This is how you should look at it for a second. This is how you should try to figure out, without giving the answer, how to solve this challenge." So, in a companion with this uh, project, there's the uh, Pony Owash Juice Shop book. So, it, it goes through the methodology of walking the dog, of going through the website, and clicking on the things. How if I were a regular user, how would I use the application? Kind of first understanding how I would use the juice shop in a normal setting. And then as an attacker, how would I start attacking it? So the vulnerabilities aren't like, oh, I've got an SSS to pop and alert one. That's great. Still happens in production, but still you want to get deeper and have more real kind of very similar attacks that you would see that are more nested and harder to get to. So with with this project, definitely achieves that of you know find fun SQL injection problems and like tiered XSS problems without using the front application like I said earlier, using Postman to help bypass those kind of client side restrictions that we can easily bypass using the API. So it, it really is a reflection of the uh, a more modern environment. So. Kind of like I mentioned, uh, we'll do a, first we'll do a walkthrough of the application, kind of see how it works. Quick walkthrough, and then we'll uh, go through some vulnerabilities. A little disclaimer, with the book they say to go through the scoreboard and try to find that. And then we'll try you know, go through these kind of vulnerabilities and then uh, see how it go. Any questions so far or comments, memes? I noticed you talked about, you know, like Burb and Zap and then. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question is, uh, kind of using commercial, tool, commercial tools versus uh, uh, free and uh, low-cost tools as well. I've used IBM AppScan. That's also a great tool, but um, you know that's good for more point and shoot, and then as well as following up with you know for an automated testing scenario. But following up with uh, as well manual testing, kind of like how do I work in tandem with like say one user account using that you know the AppScan to help uh, scan, and then using another account with a uh, burp or zap and kind of like figuring out like you know from at the same time. Um, you know, using those tools as well, but you know, they work great too. It's just as far as um, you know how you're comfortable with them and kind of putting the time into like work with the tools. But you know, I've, I like burp a lot, but it's like a lot of you know this rep repetition and 
run through apps, and then but AppScan is really good too, and helps find a lot of cool things too. Anything else? All right. Okay, doke. So I'm gonna pop right over to uh, VMware. Oh darn it! I thought I left it on. All right. One second. Almost there. Red five, pull up. All right. So, you know, a very basic uh, application where we um, see that we can uh, just quickly spin up on a, a standard Ubuntu machine. So, I'll, I have Chromium installed on here. And um, this is actually even harder than I thought it would be. So, you know, the, the basic setup for uh, running this box, well, running this version of, uh, oh shoot, running the uh, Docker image. is as simple as you know as mentioned running the uh, just this command so we'll copy that real quick we'll go back to our terminal paste that in not type in docker twice all right that's it the, the website's running literally that's all it takes we browse to that website boom now we're into the juice up so the juice shop is, like I suggest, a juice shop. So here we have uh, different kind of juices we can add to our basket and a standard uh, e-commerce website. So we can't really do a whole lot from here without creating an account. So first we'll create an account. Log on, register, uh, Andy at andy.com, super. Secret Spring 2017. I mean, uh, and I got changed to Summer 2017. All right. So now we're in our uh, our website, and we're just go ahead, and we can see a product description through here. Uh, juice, all-time classic apple juice. And we just click this little button here. Uh, add to our cart. So our basket now has one thing of apple juice. You can see the price here is $1.99. We've got one of those juices. And we'll go ahead and uh, check out. So that's our receipt for our order. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. Pretty straightforward, but you know, all along that whole entire way, there's about a bajillion vulnerabilities that we'll soon discover. So even the, though this is a seemingly simple website, there's so many issues that pop are you know, available to us to help discover that we'll soon see that, you know, may seem simple and short, but has a lot of opportunity for us to learn and investigate. So earlier we mentioned there's a scoreboard. And so if I didn't read the book and if I was trying to start to poke around, how, you know, all those screenshots from earlier all reflected vulnerabilities associated with a juice shop. Surprise! So start with going to more tools, developer tools, and now we have a really super sweet way of assessing the website. So let's refresh the page. And now we can see all the traffic associated with our <clears throat> with the, the site itself. So we know that you know we want to see the source code for the website, so we go to the source. Source has all the website. This, you know, the index, you know, in particular has. Uh, oops, oh, secret. We have like the the vulnerability, uh, the source code for this website, and so basically, you just start reading. So unfortunately, I was already scrolled down to. What's that? Uh, it's not, really, not quite a spa, but I look at yeah, but it's, it is in their website though. But um, yeah, things you commonly see in the uh, production and double are like, oh, this is really cool. 
I did this on this weekend. It's in production now. Oh, great. Was it assessed? No, not really. So uh, we go through here, and just like quickly scanning through the comments, we see Internet Explorer sadness up there, kind of compatibility issues. But that's fine, one day. So we scroll through, header, uh, not interesting. You can see that we see the log on, which we saw earlier. Log out now that we're authenticated. The language menu for the different kind of languages. You can see here like English, French, and all those different languages. And scroll down, scroll down, so the nav, and uh, different kind of checks. We see this thing called drop down and uh, scoreboard. So I always like to say, what does that do? Is it still live? Is it living? Is it accessible? So let's get rid of search. And then, see how we've been uh, checking things out. We see a scoreboard. And helpfully, we see this green little pop up at the very top showing what challenge what we have solved. So here we can see we solved the very first challenge of discovering the scoreboard associated with this project. So the scoreboard has different kind of various challenges at different levels of difficulties that help us to understand really like you know the level of effort you know to like help find these kind of problems. So this problem is really kind of highlighting the you know the ease of availability of finding common data code that we you know still have dead code or a forgotten website that may be vulnerable that was forgotten about and not removed and uh, can still pose a problem to the website or to the company. So if we have F5 or refresh that. We can see now this is now solved. The scoreboard challenge is now solved with this difficulty of one star. So with Docker, you could commit changes and kind of like snapshot the, the, the container. But, or if you do a, you know, your um, reboot or any kind of uh, change like that, you lose your progress. So the nice thing about this as well is we can save our progress. I believe it's a code. And we can restore, so if we know that the, you know, we're going to reboot or where we may be, we can save our, our progress and you know, come back to it and have, you know, the same uh, number of challenges unlocked. So the next challenge is uh, prove a, uh, provide an error that's not very gracefully handled. So the best place to do that is in anywhere there's a text. So I'm going to start hacking. Hacking, apostrophe. You know, apostrophe is the best way to hack. So we close enter. We see that this elite hack resulted in a uh, not, uh, not graceful uh, um, error. We can see here in the console that we got a 500. Uh, it was the apostrophe at the very end. Yeah, I mean, but I was, I was hacking too. So I mean, it was, it was a lot of hacks. I had the hacks first and the apostrophe. It runs faster that way. And we can see that we have a graceful error here in the uh, console, kind of giving us, you know, oh, they're trying to be very helpful and kind of help us understand, oh, wow. Well, that's cool. So we'll go back to our scoreboard. We can see that now we have uh, two challenges done. So apostrophes are commonly you know, used to help uh, do SQL injection. And SQL injection is a way to help uh, break out of uh, queries to a database with information or any kind of way to help you know, circumvent kind of controls and make the application do what it was intended to do. So that's why I really did the apostrophe was to help show that it's not really aggressively handled. It's not going to be uh, good news for this application. And so again, another way, you know, another fun thing that we try to do is do the uh, infamous uh, alert one box. Again, we've got a text input field, so let's try some more elite hacks, and we'll just do a script. Oh, at first, let's kind of talk about the challenge. So we have an XSS tier one. So for the tier one perform re reflected, XSS attack with this specific uh, script. So kind of lazy. So let's just copy. Scrolls and then paste. Boom! XSS1. Nice. So here we see, you know, again, the green box. It's pretty sweet. I could pretty much be done by now. 
cut them a million dollars, a lot of lead hacks. But this is a great opportunity to learn uh, the uh, you know, different kind of like, this low hanging fruit doesn't take much work to help provide you know, to like the developers and the management team that like, oh, the positive we have SQL injection, not crisply handled at all. With this uh, text field, the search box, we can pop XSS. You know, for that's really what we're trying to accomplish here and kind of understand that you know, for these kind of problems, it's not really, it didn't take much rocket science to try to understand that like, developers didn't really do their job of due diligence to make sure that these kind of things were not scrubbed out through client side or even server side uh, validation checks of character input sanitization. So we need to make sure that we help communicate with preferably a demo of just how easy it is to perform these kind of attacks and kind of communicate that kind of threat to the organization. And so uh, in the interest of time, we know that with these uh, developer tools, we can see all the different kinds of source code associated with uh, the application itself. So we can see that, oh, no, that's just a picture, awkward. We see, again, this long string of information. I mean, I read really fast, but I can't read that fast to help make sense of any of this information. So again, that pretty print, pretty print please, boom. We have now the, uh, a much cleaner and workable version to help review the source, look for any kind of uh, nasties or anything like that. So we scroll down, we're, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking, and we see that we see all the routes associated with this website. Routes like change password and things like administration. Oh, that's pretty sweet. I bet you. If I were to go to administration, it's going to have a protection. I'm not going to be able to get into it. It's going to have a portal. All the good you know, prevention met uh, methodologies help to uh, prevent that. Nope. There's the administrator portal. So you know, again, this uh, helps look for authentication for you know, administrative users. I just created that Andy user as a basic user. I'm able to get to the administrative portal. The problem is. Now, from an administrative point of view, I can see all the initial uh, accounts associated with uh, this website. I can see the feedback. I can see a lot of things that I shouldn't see as a regular user. So again, kind of authentication and kind of those kind of controls that should be in place and tested and validated. So one of the challenges is to remove all the sweet five-star feedback. We can see one five-star feedback, a four-star, two-star, four-star. Well, as a regular user, I shouldn't be able to delete anything in this portal, but I can. So we can see we've got lots of another challenge to uh, delete all the five-star feedback. And so let's really start wrecking things. Just with only using Chrome. I'm not busting out App Scan, which is a great tool as well. I'm not you know, busting out like any SQL injection problems. I'm just basically using application and kind of using a uh, pass forward that I went, you know, I didn't see administrative administration up in the top nor already see scoreboard, but doing analysis of the source code and kind of like just thinking about, oh, if I try administration, I can try probably make, you know, to then get to this portal on, you know, without an administrative, administrative account. And tools like uh, DeerBuster and DeerB would also kind of enumerate these kind of directories and give you hits as well to like, you know, quickly, you know, for a real website, you want to, you know, time is key, so trying to help, use those tools to help uh, enumerate uh, commonly uh, used names for web pages and routes associated with uh, this, uh, you know, with this website or where we're trying to assess. So, you know, this is a great way to learn, uh, you know, uh, JavaScript problems and APIs. Uh, I'm going to try to do another one. So let's. Quick question. Sure. Flags, whenever you get that green box. Um, I don't know offhand. Okay. It, it might be, but I'm not too sure of that. Sorry about that. That's fine. All right. Yep. Um, I offhand. Yeah, I believe like that is, you know, that is captured here in the uh, network. You know, all the XHR, XHR calls as well. So I think. 
like, what's that? Yeah, like, there's a website call right here. And um, yeah, it's a great tool to help just you know, understand more application as far as what kind of headers are we, are we sending? What kind, are we, what kind of things are we should not be advertising to uh, attacker as far as like say server version or any kind of thing else that should be removed as a header from our, uh, our website? But yeah, that's a great question as well. And that challenge, I think it's, they're all uh, the same off of those squids. All right, so let's bust out Postman. So Postman is used to help work with those uh, APIs. And um, the great thing about working with uh, APIs is that they're you know, pretty, they try to help the user, try to help the developer make it very straightforward to help make an operation go forward. So I know that I can go back here to the main website. Make sure I have my tools running. So if I add, let's say, this egg, egg, uh, something juice, I go to my basket. I'm seeing all these operations here on the left hand, on the right hand side. So if I were to say, increase the quantity, I should be able to see. Let's see. I should see, be able to see the request payload used in that operation. So if I slowly scoot this over, I can see a great deal of information here about this, uh, this, this, this request. So I'm making a put request, that's really weird, to, you know, for my basket, you know, for uh, this thing. Great thing about a developer tools, right click, copy, copy as a curl. So a curl could be used as a command line to help you know, query to a website and you know, perform quickly a, a test. Postman is super helpful. Like, you want to import that? I would love to import that. Let's import paste raw text and paste that whole curl command. So that's a lot of text. That's a really weird whatever. So in my, now in my operation for Postman, I can see all of those headers that Chrome was using. So I have a token, I have everything else I was going to use. And the body that was going to be sent, I have a quantity of two. So this kind of goes back to validation of saying, you know, are we using positive and negative inputs? Are we using characters? Are we using any kind of like things that we should be expecting? So if I were to do like negative 77 70 something and send that along, I should, it shouldn't be, I should not AC that much quantity or a negative value. But as we can see, this operation succeeded. So now, you know, this, you know, went along, talked to the website, say, cool, whatever. Yeah, negative bajillion values. So if I were to go back to the website, F5, I see a negative, you know, way bajillion uh, quantity. Check out, and I, Solve another challenge. So, I should not have been able to do this and pr produce, you know, getting paid. And that goes ahead and solves the challenge we can see right here of, uh, let's see, successfully solve challenge, payback uh, time, pushing where that makes you rich. So, as we're exploring the website, we kind of look for interesting URLs. And so, when we make an order, it's kind of hard to see up here, but Right after the order is made, we see a website for the, you know, the IP, the port, and we also see slash FTP. Why would orders be served off an FTP website? Why would my receipts be served off there? Let's browse it. Boom! That's a lot of cool things in there we see. And so here we see all kinds of things like uh, package.json.back file, like a backup file of our JSON. So this is all a uh, uh, inventory of all the libraries and packages, no packages used on our website. So that shouldn't be there. We shouldn't see be, here's my orders that I made you know, through the normal portal. But we also see all these other files that we shouldn't be able to see. So if we just try to browse them, we can see a lot of different things, like all the things we should not be able to see, like this should not be available to us. This were a real file. And so, uh, you know, it's like exploring, kind of prodding and touching all the things that we want available to us. We want to make sure that 
we're testing all the things that we don't really, you know, would not accept a normal user to do, but potentially could do. And so um, there's a lot more to explore. There's a ton more challenges to explore and understand and learn. And the book, and there's a lot of websites available as well to help uh, help you out with the uh, different challenges, kind of give you hints, and kind of progressively kind of inch you towards trying to learn, like, without giving you the answer, what to look for and how to look for them, how you would test them, and just explore the website more and more and keep on going. So this in itself is a mini CTF and a cool way to learn uh, ways to break JavaScript and APIs and just keep on going to harder and uh, more cool challenges. And uh, so, you know, that's great for, you know, messing around with, uh, whoops. That's great for messing around with, you know, play things and kind of, you know, hopefully in production, you might see some of the things, but also as, uh, oh, this is weird. Where else you might see these kind of challenges? Well, offensive security has these kind of different challenges with, you know, these are certifications with the offensive security uh, certifications. And so one of them, the OSCE, uh, you know, the one of the courses they have is cracking the perimeter. And so to get into the crack the perimeter uh, course, you need to help do these kind of challenges to first break through these challenges to get us their key to tell, like, you know, OFSEC that, yep, I, I know these skills. I can get through, like, the, this kind of shake down things, help uh, kind of prove, like, I know, have some knowledge of these kind of attack craft methodologies and ways to break in. And right here, they say use a source. You know, as we saw with, you know, with uh, Juice Shop, we saw that there's, um, you know, using the source, we would like, glean a lot of information and help break in. And so it's just kind of like poking and prying and trying to understand what's going on can really help us in uh, real life situations. <coughs> and with that, uh, I'm done. Uh, website, I have uh, Twitter, and um, I'm part of a uh, Slack group over in Omaha. And uh, it's a, if you're interested in joining as well, we have that URL to help uh, to join another Slack group we might be a part of and uh, talk about security all the time and uh, some memes, mostly security. And uh, a link for the uh, OWASP juice shop and uh, questions. All right, thanks. Appreciate it.